to be. All right. Back to what, you know, godly stuff. Uh, okay, so uh, obviously, you know, over the last several weeks, um, I, I feel like there's been kind of a, a burden that's been put in my heart towards things. And, and this week, I feel like I, I really want to get radical on, on that. And so, uh, um, you know, to be honest with you when, you, when you look at the Bible and you look at people like Paul, I mean, raise your hand if you think Paul was a great man. Right? Right? I, he was a great man, and he loved the Lord, and he gave his life for the Lord. And we raise our hands because we know he was great, and the reason why he was great is because he was radical. And so I really, I, am, I feel like God just is really wanting to draw us to a place where we are completely and totally radical for the Lord. Radical. I mean, people look at us and say, are you an idiot? You're really going to do that for him? Yeah, yeah, I am. I'm going to do it for him. And, uh, but I also, you know, and I, I just want to keep emphasizing this, um, especially whenever there are people that maybe have never heard me before, have heard me speak, but sometimes I get loud. And, uh, but I want you to, to understand the grace that, that I have for, for this. Um, the grace in, that, that God provided me until my eyes were opened. You know, and honestly, to tell the truth, I'm not trying to say that my eyes are completely opened. God is still showing me grace right now as I speak because my eyes aren't completely opened yet. And so the same thing I want to do is I want to extend grace to people um, in the room as I, as I preach this. So if I get loud and I shout and I'm not trying to beat you into submission, I'm just passionate. I'm just passionate. So there's this question and uh, you don't have to put it yet. I, you, never mind. It, there it is. There, there's a question that has plagued man since the beginning of human history. Philosophers have spent centuries pondering it. Scientists have spent decades ignoring it. And many of us have spent hours on our couch just wondering, asking ourselves this question. Now, I was going to say, could you guess what the question is? But you got it. <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, I, I, I can remember my, my pre-Christ, my B.C., before Christ days. And uh, I remember just sitting in my bedroom, 14, 15, 16 years old, asking myself that question. You know, what's the purpose of life? You know, why am I here? And one of the great things about being a Christian is that we actually come to a place uh, where we can know. We really can't know why we're here, what our purpose is for. And uh, I, I think that that is just the, the, the result of a loving God, to be honest with you. Because, you know, the deist, the deist will say that God just created us, and then he's left us to fend for ourselves. You see, so it's like, you know, there's, here's this powerful God, and for whatever reason, he decides to create and he creates, and he creates humans, and then he just bails. Thank God that's not the God I serve. Because he wants to give us purpose. He wants us to feel fulfilled in our life. He wants us to be able to relax in knowing that he's in control of our purpose. Because a lot of us stay up late at night wondering those questions. I hope last week that, uh, that you, like Linda said, I hope that you were able to meet with God last week. And uh, I feel like that the Spirit has really been moving well inside this building. Um, I hope last week's message helped you to realize that God does love you. He does. You know, and if you weren't here last week, the whole message was centered around why we continue to sin. Why do we continue to run back to our vomit like a dog does? I mean, take that picture. I want, you, I want that to be so ingrained in your mind that you can't forget it because that's what you're doing when you run back to sin. But why do we do it? It's because we really don't believe God loves us. We don't really believe we're worthy of His kindness. But we are. We are. And I hope last week that you were able to get that. 
I hope you were. And this week, what I want to do is I want to talk about your purpose. And in order to start with that, we have to go back all the way to Adam and Eve. I'm going to do a little explaining here for a minute. So, Adam and Eve, what we have to realize is that Adam and Eve would have been real-life superheroes. They would have been real-life superhumans. Every talent, every gift that exists in mankind today was first planted in Adam and Eve. Right? So you could imagine Adam would have been smart. He would have been handsome. He probably would have had a good build. You know, he, every positive thing that there is about humanity, I mean, of course, that's our American thinking. I know at one point uh, it was actually you were more attractive if you were chunky. So who knows? Maybe he was chunky. All I'm saying that all of the best attributes, all of the best gifts, everything were in Adam and Eve. And as Adam and Eve begin to have children, they begin to pass down those things to, to each and every one of us until it eventually got to us. And uh, I just want to share some scriptures with you right quick that, that shows this. We're going to start with Lamech. And this is Genesis chapter 4, verse 19. Lamech was the eighth generation from Adam. And so he would have been like his sixth great-grandpa, right? And he was the son of Methuselah. Most people know that person because he was the oldest person in the Bible. And this is what it says. It says, Lamech took to himself two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the other was Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal, or Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. So if you've ever had livestock, or cows, or you've ever worked cows, or you've worked horses, raise your hand. Well, there you go. There's the man that you got your gift from, if you were good at it. I, I was terrible. I, I worked horses, and it wasn't very good. I just did it for summer, and I never went back because I, I didn't like it very much. But if you're gifted in those type of things, right there, it came from Jabel. He's the father of that. And then it says in verse 21, his brother named Jubal, he was the father of all of those who play the lyre and the pipe. So if you play a musical instrument, raise your hand. Well, there you go. Jubal, that's who you have to think. Or thank, not think, thank. Jubal was the first guy to play instruments, to play musical instruments. And so he's the father of those things. You keep reading. As for Zilla, she also gave birth to Tubal, Tubal Cain, the forger of implements of all bronze and iron. So he basically was the first blacksmith. So we see these things, these gifts that are being fed into us as, as, we, as you know, the lineage goes from Adam and he begins to disperse. And, and uh, I wonder if you took Zubal, or I'm sorry, no, Jubal, who was the, the leer and the, and the pipe player, and you stuck him over as the blacksmith, how good he would have done. Now, I wonder if you took the blacksmith and you stuck him over there with the leer or a pipe, and uh, how good would he have done? He wouldn't have done any good. They wouldn't have because they weren't gifted to do, to do that. You see, God has gifted us all individually in different ways. Now, how many of you guys would probably think that Noah probably was gifted to build boats? Right? I mean, look at the boat he built. It was pretty darn big. I'm going to give you one more scripture here for the evidence that, that supports this. this. We jump forward into the book of Exodus. And what we have here is that the, the children of God have come out of Egypt... And they're coming to a place where uh, um, they have been given the instructions on how to build the tabernacle of God. Excuse me. I know this is boring. I see lots of yawns going on, but this is, I, 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 this is a point that I want to make. Um, so we come to a place where the tabernacle of God needs to be built. And this is what God says to Moses. It says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, Bezalel something, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all kinds of craftsmanship to make artistic designs for work in gold and silver and in bronze and in the cutting of stones for setting. Sounds like the first jeweler, doesn't it? And in the carving of the wood that he may work in all kinds of craftsmanship. And behold, I myself have appointed with him 
Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan. And in the hearts of all who are skillful, I have put skill, that they may make all that I have commanded you. You see, every skill that you have right now in your life, you didn't do it. It's plain and simple. God has put everything that you have the ability to do in your life. And it's one of the things that makes me so frustrated when I see these, these sports athletes and they're out there and, man, they just think they're hot stuff. They think that it's them that give them the ability to be able to do what they do. Now, I, know, I do know that the better athletes do work hard, but the ability to do all the things that they do did not come from them. It comes from God above. Everything that you've ever done well, you didn't do it because you, did, you were perfect or you're, you were something special. or You are special, but not in that way, not in the prideful way. You did it because God has given you the ability to do things that you couldn't do if he didn't exist. Plain and simple. When he puts his spirit in us, when he drives us, when he created us, he planted stuff in us. And now we have all of these people sitting in this room that can do all kinds of things. That's incredible. That's absolutely incredible. I can guarantee you there's one thing in your life that you can do that most people can't do. I don't care what it is. Maybe it's tattooing like Mark does. You know, maybe, maybe it's playing a bass like, like uh, Rick does. Man, I had a brain fart there. Man, sorry about that. N known him probably longer than anybody in this entire room, and I forgot his name. <laughs> uh, I think I met Rick at age five. Just Anyways, got to get back on track here. All right, God has given us gifts. Now, what we have to do is we have to really seriously think about this. If God has given us gifts and talents, why? Why did he give us gifts and talents? Did, did he put skill in us so that we could glorify ourselves? Did he put the skill in us to make us rich? Did he put that skill in you so you could build a bigger house? Well, unless you're a contractor. Because <laughs> then you do have the skill to build, build a bigger house. But is that his purpose? Did he put the skill in you so that you could be on the cover of a magazine? No, he didn't. But one thing I know for sure is that he definitely didn't put the gifts, the talents, and the skills in your life to be wasted. He definitely didn't do that. That's a fact. He put it in you for his purpose. That's why it's there. So firstly, um, I just want to say that, you know, he did give us gifts for our nine to fives. Okay, so each and every one of us should, if we are following scripture, because scripture says, if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat, right? It says that, that a person that's not willing to work is worse than an unbeliever. So we need to have jobs. We need to have something that we're doing. We need to be taking care of our family in some way. I do realize that there are some people that have disabilities and things like that. But even people with disabilities have the ability through God's power to be able to do things to help raise their family up in a way that needs to be done in a godly fashion. Right? So no matter what, we should all be doing something to help our families. And a lot of times that's our nine to five. But it goes further than that, you see. You know, we had the, we had, I think there's probably blessings for construction workers. I think there's blessings for car salesmen, as long as they tell the truth. <laughs> Bob. <laughs> I'm picking on Bob today. <laughs> I think there's probably gifting and welding. There's gifting and handling children, because I'm telling you right now, not all of us can do that. Because a lot of times, I just want to kill them. And you gotta, you're going to be thankful that I'm up here and I'm not, I'm not back there with your kids, okay? Because uh, you guys wouldn't want me as your pastor up here. <laughs> there's giftings for mechanics. I mean, there's all different types of giftings. And we saw that, but we saw last, uh, well, it was a few weeks ago, that we saw that those giftings aren't for us. We use them because God has given them to us but they're not for us. Ephesians 4.28 says, He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. 
You don't work to build your own kingdom. You work to help people. It's plain and simple. I'm talking about getting radical here, right? Because this doesn't compute with our American mentality. We want the bigger boat. We want the nicer golf clubs. Give me the bigger house. You know what? My door, I, I, stinking, I stained a door the other day that was nine foot tall. They paid $12,000 for their front door. $12,000 for a front door. How many people have a front door like that? <laughs> yeah, right? I, don't get me wrong. I love, I love the people. They're so kind and, they're, and they're, they're gentle. But at the same time, oh my goodness. Lord, if I just had $12,000... I, if I had $12,000, I'd hope that I wouldn't have a broke down truck. You know what I mean? You see, John 10.10 10 says that Jesus came to give life and give life abundantly. We, God wants us to have an abundant life. He really does. He wants us to be so blessed that people will look at us and say, holy cow, I need some of that. Right? And, I, and I'm not talking about my, the worldly possessions or anything like that. I'm talking about the Spirit of God that lives inside of me, that gives me joy, that gives me peace, that gives me happiness. People should look at us and say, wow, look at him. Look at her. They're incredible. But you see, the problem is, is that we do want that. As human beings, we all want peace. We all want joy. We all want happiness. We all want to be able to go to sleep at night and not have to worry about a bill that needs to be paid the next day. We all want that stuff. But God says, stop chasing that. Chase me, and I'll give you all of that. What are you laughing about, Edward? <laughs> You see, God says, I want you to have stuff. I do. Because you're my, you're my son. I'm the king, right? And as a king, you're an heir to the throne. And I want to in, you know, cover you with the king's riches. But you've got to stop chasing the king's riches. Let the king give it to you. You go out and help my people. Do what I've called you to do. And I've called you to bless others. You know, I just, I just finished a book today, or actually yesterday, and this is actually the most popular book right now in the Christian world. Um, people are just buying it everywhere you go. They're talking about it, and it's because it's a true, it's truth. It's called Return of the Gods. Right now in this nation, there is a return of the worship of the old gods of the Old Testament. We don't realize that what we're doing, but we are. There's three of them. There's Baal, there's Molech, and there's uh, Ishtar. Ishtar was the god of sexuality. And she was worshipped by cross-dressers. She was worshipped by people, who, men who wanted to be changed into women, and women who wanted to be changed into men. That was her worshippers. Are we not seeing that? Molech, what, the way you worshipped him was child sacrifice. Moloch, there, there was actually statues that was in the, in the Canaanite land, this, you know, the, the land that everyone gives uh, the Bible such a hard time because the Israelites go in and they, and they wipe out the, the, the Canaanites. And, and they say, oh, that's just, that's just terrible. It shouldn't happen. There were statues that were found there with Moloch standing like this, with his hands like this. And they would heat the hands up until they were red hot and then set their babies in the hands. And just let them fry. Abortion. All the abortion. Look at the fight that, came, that went against the idea of not killing babies anymore. Are you kidding me? It's Moloch worship. And the one that I want to really point out is Baal worship. Baal was the god of prosperity and money and stuff. And I'll, you know what his symbol was? Anybody know what the, the symbol of Baal was? His idol? It was a bull. You ever seen Wall Street? Out in front of Wall Street, that big bull? There's not, that's not by accident. It's Baal worship. 
America has become ball worshipers. We chase stuff and we worship stuff and we're unwilling to put it down. Second Corinthians, or I'm sorry, Colossians 3 2 says, Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on the earth. And like I said, I know this really jacks up our American thinking because all we've ever done is go to school so we can buy stuff, get a better education so we can get more stuff. I mean, the whole financial crisis that we went through several years back was because all of the kids wanted what mom and dad had worked hard for, and so they go out and get loans at banks to get nice cars, nice homes, and then the note comes due and they can't pay it. We are ball worshipers. I don't think we can really comprehend what Paul is telling us here. And i got a challenge here that I just want you to think about. I'm not asking you to do it. And let me also say that I'm challenging myself in this. Because I'm the same way. I'm an American too. You know? And this mentality has been ingrained in me as well. And so I'm challenging myself. If I said to you that I wanted you to give up everything this month, except for your 9 to 5, of course. We all got to do that. God has called us to work. And fill those moments with kingdom-centered things. How many of you would actually do it? Now, I'm talking about not going to our kids' games. Not even letting our kids go to games. Staying at home instead and reading the Bible. Putting together a meal to go out and help a family. The basketball games that's on TV. The football games that are on TV. The, the, the party that you're supposed to go with with all your work employees. Put all that stuff off and do kingdom-centered things. All of it. Every single bit. Don't even turn the TV on. If you even think about turning on the TV, pick up the Bible. None of your TV shows, nothing. How many of us would actually do it? Exactly. We're ball worshipers. We think more about this than we do this. We care more about this than we do this. Every one of us, and I'm including myself. If I said next month, everything that you've been setting back money for, apartment, a new house, vacation, Christmas, if I said, take every bit of that money, and give it away to people who need it. How many of us would do it? None of us. None of us. Because we are so attached to this instead of this. The very, it, all through Scripture, it constantly tells us, let go of the world. Think about what's ahead. Think about that. And as Americans, it's so hard for us to realize that we are trapped. We're in bondage to stuff. We serve our stuff. I go to work and work hard so I can go and get me an awesome cheeseburger. We're enslaved to so many things and we don't even realize it. Like I said, God does want to bring increase into our lives. He really does. The parable of the talents showed that. You know, if you guys know the story of the parable of the talents. You know, one guy was given ten talents, and that's, a, that's money is what a talent is. One was given ten, one was given five, and then one was given one. The one that got ten went out and made ten more, he, the, the, and when the master came, he said, good job. The one that got five, he made five more. The master said, good job. But the one who had one, he said he buried it in the ground because he knew that uh, if, he, if he was to lose it, that God would be mad. He said, man, you could have put it in the bank, at least made interest. So that that, what that is saying is that God wants us to bring increase into our lives. He wants to bring increase into our lives, but he does not bring increase into our lives so we can get more stuff. He brings increase into our lives so that we can increase the kingdom. Been through all of our increase, 
is for the purpose of bringing increase to the kingdom. Then because of our faithfulness and obedience, God will bring increase into our lives that we could not even have dreamed of. Stop chasing worldly possessions and chase after God. Look at, look at King David. You know, several years, well, it won't even be, I wouldn't say several years, several months back, we went through a whole series where I went through all of the Old Testament characters, the ones they call the heroes of the faith in Hebrews. And what we did was we looked at all their failures. Because they're called the heroes of the faith, but they were just fail, failures at, at all kinds of sorts of stuff. David was nothing but a failure in a lot of areas of his life. But God said, he's still a man after my own heart. My own heart. And so even though he failed, because he was a, God, a man after God's own heart, what did he become? A king. He was given a kingdom. You see? But we want to chase our things. We want to chase our stuff. You know, we think it's so much better if we can just go get this one thing over here. I'll do that some other time. And then we go get that thing over there and think, well, we just need that thing over there. And we'll go over there and get it. And then we think, well, just one more time over there. And the next thing you know, we've spent our whole life spinning our wheels, getting a bunch of stuff, and we've got nothing to say about our future life in heaven. There's nothing there for us. You see, we're supposed to be storing up our treasures for heaven. Not for here, not for earth. Let's get radical on this. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared, hand, prepared beforehand so that we would walk in him. Walk in them. Okay, leave that scripture up there for a second. If you guys didn't really hear what I said, what are, what are we created for? Come on. No, that's who we are. We're God's workmanship. What are we created for? Good works. Good works. Who created them for us? God did. Why did he create, create them for us? So that we would walk in them. Walk in them! You know, God gave me this picture this last week. I love this verse. This is a verse that has really touched my heart. And in fact, I'm thinking about even getting it tattooed on me. And I, I was thinking maybe having them tattoo it backwards. So every time I looked in the mirror, I could read it. You know, because if I got it tattooed where you guys could read it, when I look in the mirror, it's going to be backwards and I can't read it. I was thinking, God gave me this picture. I do paint and things like that and I do construction work and this last week we did a lot of hole drilling a lot of hole drilling and by the end of the the week the bit was so dull that we couldn't drill anymore with it and so it could no longer serve its purpose and so I threw we threw it away I think that God showed me a picture that a lot of us sitting here today really feel like you've been thrown away you really feel like that, that, that there's a purpose that maybe passed you by, that, you, that there's nothing that you can do about it anymore, that, that, that you're sitting there, you're on the outside looking in, and the whole world's passing you by, and you feel like you have a purposeful, purposeless life. I believe that. I believe that's the reason why we work so hard to try and gain stuff, because we don't realize that there's actually a purpose that God has, wants to use us for. Some of you feel like that tool that's been tossed out. Some of you feel like maybe you've been forgotten. But the problem is, is you have a purpose and you're not walking in it. That's why you feel the way you do. We all have a purpose. God has given us all a purpose. Start walking in your purpose. Stop chasing the abundant life and provide one for somebody. You see, that's the first purpose of our life. Then there's the second purpose. We all have two purposes. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12 says, And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors, and some as teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to building up the body of Christ. So here we have five gifts that are called the equipping gifts, right? Right? Basically, these people, the ones that walk in these gifts, like I would be one of them, um, it says 
The, the third one is pastors. And then Mark, we bring him on Sunday nights. He's the teacher. We are here to equip you to do the work of the ministry. I know a lot of times people think the pastor is the one that's supposed to do it all, but that's not true. My job is to train you guys up and so you can go out and do it yourself. And then if everything's done right, what happens is, is that, that, that he, kept, he becomes a pastor, and, and he becomes a pastor, and, and she becomes a pastor, and then she becomes a pastor, and they go out and they start their own churches, and I get a new group of people in here, and I equip them. And they're out there, and they're equipping people, and we just continue to do that, and we multiply the church, and the church grows, and it increases, but the problem is that they were too busy chasing stuff. Now, obviously, not everybody fits into that list. That's kind of a, an incomplete list. And so what we have to do, actually, I'll tell you an inter interesting detail about Ephesians. There's a reason why it was an incomplete list. Ephesians, as far as we know and what history shows us, is that he, the, the letter of Ephesians wasn't actually written for the Ephesians. The letter of Ephesians was actually the letter that was meant to circulate to all of the churches, and so one of the th best letters that you can read when it comes to understanding how the church is supposed to work is Ephesians. If you go to the book of Ephesians and read that, that was for every church in the area where most of the letters, like the one that I'm about to read from, was for the Corinthian church only. That's why Ephesians is such a good letter to read. But in 1 Corinthians, as he's talking to the Corinthian church, he tries to kind of narrow in a little bit. And he says... In 1 Corinthians 12, 28, And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, and third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. So this leaves nobody out. How many can help? Everybody. Every one of us has a position in the church. Every one of us. We have a duty, we have a calling, and it's not just sitting in the chair. Our job, our fulfillment, our joy, our pleasure would come when we finally lay the stuff down and realize that our purpose, our destiny starts right here. Right here. And if we got people from out of town, it's in your own church. You know, the, the, we've got two visitors right here. When you go back to wherever you go to church, and hopefully you do, but when you go into that church, you have a purpose for the, in that church and duties to fulfill. Just like each and every one of us do here. Now, what's funny is, is that a lot of people don't want to do any duties. They say they want to help. They, they ask, is there a way that we can, we can help? I, I've been getting a lot of messages lately. Well, I'd really like to find a way to help. Well, Shane and Larry sure does need help in the morning setting things up, but nobody shows up. Because they don't realize that that's where you start. You start at the bottom, show God you're faithful, and you work your way up. I got people that are wanting to be on the worship team that are living together in unmarried relationships. And I'm like, they say, well, I feel like God told me that I'm supposed to. And I said, then what that tells me is that God wants you to go back to Scripture and look and see what, it, what the requirement is for a leader, then change your life to look like that so that you can be on the worship team. You don't just jump straight in. If God has called you to be a pastor, it ain't going to happen today. I was prophesied, what, 17 years ago that I would be a pastor. Never wanted to be a pastor. But here I am a pastor. It took, it took 12 years before I finally got there. I don't know where I'm going with that because it has nothing to do with purpose except for that was my purpose. Do you want to feel fulfillment, in, feel fulfillment in your life? Do you want to feel like you have purpose? It starts right here. It really does. It doesn't start at your 9 to 5. Unless you're taking your 9 to 5 and you're using it for the kingdom purpose. Let's get radical. Let's let the whole town of Miami know who we are. Because we step out and we help people. First Peter 4.10 says, As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another. As good stewards over the manifold grace of God. You guys understand that this grace that I'm telling you. You know, 
statistically speaking, and I'm not gonna, I don't want to speak the curse over anybody here. I hope that every person here is motivated today to step up and start to try and find a place that they can serve, either in here or somewhere in the community. But statistically speaking, most of us are going to go home and continue to chase our stuff. I hate that, but it's just, it's just the truth. Now, I, I hope that for us, it'll be different. I really do. And I believe that it will be. I believe that statistically speaking, we're going to have more people that will be willing to step up and answer than all the rest of the churches in town. And that we will begin to, to, to do this in a way that they have their eyes opened. And then so they begin to step up and do more around town. And then the next thing you know, we've got a stinking city full of people trying to reach out and help the homeless, trying to provide places for people to live, trying to stick and help people get out of, uh, out of drug rehab. All of these different things that God wants us to do, but for some reason we're not doing it, so the government has to try and step in and do it. Amen, we are stewards of God's grace. How are you treating God's grace? Let me explain what that means. God is giving you grace because you're not stepping up into your purpose. And he is waiting for the day that you will finally say, okay, I'm going to do this. Now that you know it, are you going to be a good steward over that grace? Walking in our gift to help others is what God expects from us. It's expected. It's not something that we pick and choose whether we're going to do it or not. It's expected. And if you're going to be a good steward of that grace that covers each and every one of us, then we'll step up and we'll walk in that gift. And we'll do what we can to begin to help others. We have a family that just went through a, a horrible ordeal. Two of our youth boys' father just died. He was shot. And he didn't make it. And I'm telling you right now, those boys and that mom, they need to feel our love. They need to feel God's love through us. And so what I want to do is I want to try and come together, and we're going to create something to make these kids and this mother feel like God is sitting right next to them. Whether it's making a meal whether it's buying school supplies, you too, God has put you front and center. You find out what they need. All right? You find out what they need, we're gonna, then you bring it to the leadership, and then we will be posting things on the church page. All right? Whether it's money, whether it's blankets, I don't care what it is they need, let's give them everything that they possibly could need as a f church family. Amen? Amen? You know what? And that's just the beginning of our purpose. When you begin to see God working in their lives because of the love that we're going to show them, because it will. It will work in their lives. They're going to realize that God loves them. And they're going to continue to... Every Sunday, he's been down here on the altar, one of the boys, crying out to God to change his dad. And now he's got a lot of questions. Where are you, God? My dad didn't change. He's dead. And so it's our job as the church to come in and lift him up. Is that not a good calling? Is that not a worthy calling? Because that's the duty of the church. I wish I would have had that when my dad died. There were a few people that came over and showed us some love. There was. But we didn't have a church that came and we went to church, but when my dad got sick, we couldn't really go anymore. We didn't see anybody from that church. Nobody. Let's not be that church. Let's be the church. The church that will swoop in and help heal broken hearts. Let's pray. Father God, I just want to thank you for the desire that you've put in me to be radical, Lord. 
If we want to see this nation change, we're going to have to have some radical people. Lord, if we want to see unity amongst people in this, in this country, whether they're, they're dark skin, light skin, medium skin, Lord, we're going to need some radical people that's willing to step up and show the love of God. Father, I just pray that you would just put a passion right now in each and every person here. Lord, just to take a step. Lord, you don't ask us to do it all at once. You just say, come a little closer. Lord, I just pray right now that each and every one of us, including myself, throughout this week, we would say, Lord, help me to come a little closer. Show me what I need to do. Show me what I need to give up. Show me what has more control over me than you do. Show me what I love more in this world than I do in heaven. And help me to come just a little closer. Father, I thank you for the grace that you give us. I thank you, Lord, that you knew from before time began that, that we would each have a passion and a desire for things, to love things more than we love you. But yet you still continued to show us love. That's grace. You still sent your son to die for us. That's grace. You did not give us the things that we deserve. That's mercy. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. I pray, Lord, that we would be good stewards over that. Don't let us walk on it. Don't let us trample on it. You have given us so much. Lord, give us a heart to give back to you now. As a nation, Lord, we've been so blessed. I pray that there would just be a, a rising up in the heart of of the people of the United States to give to you, Lord, to serve your purposes. And most of all, I pray that right here, right now, in Jesus' name. And Father, I pray that if there are anyone, there's anyone here today that's ready to step up into that purpose, into that calling, that they would leave it right here at the altar. Everything that they've put before you, they would come up here today and leave it on this altar. And when they get up, they would have the sole desire to chase after your purpose for their lives. Father, I thank you and I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.